Nepal has a lot of hydro dams, hydroelectricity, and hydro potential, but it's not what you're thinking, probably. Well, when you picture a hydro dam, what do you picture? It isn't that, and it creates some obstacles. It also creates some opportunities. That's what we're going to discuss. I'm Brian. Welcome to Future Asa. Yes, Future Asa, still from Nepal. This is not a clever green screen. This is the uh, rooftop restaurant at my hotel. I had a chance to talk with a uh, lead design, uh, a lead design engineer at a hydro dam, um, a company that owns, builds, owns, operates hydroelectric dams. So let's start with the basic. Uh, Nepal has tremendous amounts of hydropower. It was something like 60% recently. Now it's closer to 90, it, well into the 90s, uh, and it's still climbing. Uh, but what this means is, um, if you go back, they had hydro 150 years ago. But if you go back even 10, 15 years, they only had about a half a terawatt. A half a terawatt of generation, that's not super exciting. Well, today they're at more like three terawatts with a whole lot more coming on. Now, when I say, it, and that's enough, right? That's enough for the whole country. Well, when I say picture a hydroelectric dam, you probably picture something like Hoover Dam or Grand Coulee Dam, a big giant face with a huge reservoir behind it. That's not what they have. They don't have the topography for it, and there are other obstacles to that sort of implementation. So instead of being able to store weeks or months or years of potential energy, they can store hours of potential energy, which means in the rainy season, it is apparently the rainy season now. They said monsoon. I didn't realize they meant mon right now. It's been raining a lot. They have an abundance of power, enough that they can export it to Bangladesh, to India. But then the dry months come and they do not have enough power. So they import it back primarily from India. India has been ramping their solar production. And guess what? When the monsoon season ends, solar production ramps up nicely. So the two power sources complement each other very well. But they've got a lot more hydro coming online. And the gentleman I spoke with did not wish to appear on camera. He said it's best to remain low profile. I uh, don't want to be the tallest blade of grass and all that. But he was happy to answer all my questions. So over the next few years, we've got uh, one under construction that's 285 megawatts, another that's under construction 381 megawatts, uh, one that'll be done this year, 73 megawatts, uh, and another one that's close to com completion at 216 megawatts. That's a terawatt right there. That's a 30, 35% increase over the power generation capacity that they have today coming online in the next year, six months to year and a half. Uh, that doesn't count all of the smaller projects. There's a ton of smaller projects also coming online. So what they're trying to build is overcapacity so that on those dry days when there is still some water flow, just not enough to power the whole country, hopefully there is. And then maybe they can export a greater percentage. See, they sell power, but they also buy power. And in the last fiscal year, which just closed, they had a surplus of, I think it was 50 billion rupees. I've got it written here somewhere. It came out to tens of millions of dollars. Tens of millions of dollars in surplus revenue coming back into the country. That helps fund additional projects. And we're gonna talk about the funding. Uh, how do you get the money? I had a lot of viewers telling me, oh no, is this another one of those Belt and Road Initiative countries that's going to be beholden to China? And the answer, surprisingly, is no. No, there were some Chinese companies that got involved early on, uh, but they have been selling off their positions. Um, there is a problem if you do too much business with China, specifically that India will not buy the power. Because India, as a government, does not care for China 
at all. So if you use Chinese turbines or Chinese financing or Chinese transformers, well, we just don't want any part of that. So uh, that is crazy. So uh, how do you finance it? Well, national banks. I mean, really just banks, real banks. You have to have 30% down and 70% uh, you can finance. So if you've got a pro if you're a private company who does hydro, you apply for your permit, you get that all sorted out. And once you get 30% funding, you can get your bank loan and break ground. Got a plane going overhead. So because these dams don't displace huge amounts of land, creating vast reservoirs, the construction time is a lot faster. You can go from nothing to completion to power output in about five years. Sometimes it takes a little longer, sometimes it takes a little less, and there are definitely obstacles. So over the next 10 years, the gentleman I spoke with believes that Nepal can bring online about another 10 gigawatts of production, uh, terawatts, it can bring on another 10 terawatts of production, 10. Today they're at three, next year they'll be at four, 10 more, eight or nine, 10 more. So that is uh, absolutely huge. Well, how much do they have? What is the potential? Well, uh, he explained to me that there was a 2001-ish study uh, put together by some big university that estimated it could be as much as 83 terawatts of production. Think of what that could do. I mean, forget electrifying Nepal. It could electrify a lot of countries, big countries. That's a lot of juice. But that was circa 2001. And if the study was published in 2001, it was probably circa 95, 96 technology. Well, technology's advanced. Uh, turbines have gotten more efficient. Transmission's gotten a little bit better. Now the estimate is it could be around 200 terawatts of potential energy. Now, of course, they're not going to harness that much. That would be the wrong amount. But is it? Is it too much? If you've got a data center, do you want to bring it here? Uh, mining Bitcoin is not exactly legal here, but I don't know that they would know what your data center is doing and you could get real cheap juice. Um, we can talk about how cheap the juice gets, uh, but right now they are 93 to 95% self-sufficient from hydro. Um, it will be 100% by 2030. And remember, this is a very small country. Transmission line losses are not a big deal. Getting the power all the way to the border and outside the country, not a big deal. Uh, so all of that ends up working. So let's talk about some of the obstacles. Now, uh, there are, of course, many obstacles. The first is you've got to finance. Well, you've got to compete with the other hydro companies to secure your chunk of the world, your little valley, whatever it may be, your river. Um, but then, of course, you have to uh, finance it. There is no power purchase guarantee. You'll see that sometimes with a big, expensive project where uh, a company says, look, we're going to build this nuclear reactor, this dam, this whatever it may be. But you have to guarantee that you're going to buy the power from me or at least pay me to not make the power. And that makes some hard feelings sometimes. But if it's uh, among friends, you have to do it. Well, India and Nepal are neighbors. They're not friends, they're neighbors. And they're friendly, but not friendly enough to guarantee power purchase. There are, when India wants power, they will buy it. If you have it, we'll buy it. But we're not gonna just have a, a standing out order for it. We're not gonna have a subscription. We'll just come in and get it when we need it, if that's okay with you. So it makes a bit of risk. That's an obstacle. Another obstacle is the government is the power authority. They decide who gets to build, they decide where, they decide uh, how much power they will take from you, they distribute all the power, and they decide the rates. So you're in somewhat of a pickle sometimes. Your home rate here is amazing. If you use less than 20 kilowatt hours per month, your power bill is zero. What? 
Well, who's using less than 20 kilowatt hours? That's, that's a very small home using almost nothing. That's someone who's just, just, just getting by. Not really living life to the fullest in terms of electronics. So for those people, uh, your power is free. Now, if you use up to 200 kilowatts, uh, kilowatt hours, it, then there's a, 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 a more reasonable, very affordable charge. And if you go over 200 kilowatt hours, you're paying um, closer to the very bottom edge of what a Western country would pay in terms of rates. But if you're the power producer and you've got a whole bunch of customers not paying, that can add up. It's a small risk, but it's a risk. It is an obstacle. Another thing they have to contend with, another obstacle is boot. Build, own, operate, transfer. So you build it, you own it, you operate it, but after 35 years, you don't own it anymore. Now it belongs to the government. So that's why they give you this deal. They might give you a 10 year tax abatement on top of it. We want you to do this. We want you to make it successful. If you can make a good chunk of change in 35 years, great. Because after that, baby, it's mine. And I think that's reasonable. I don't think that's crazy. Um, another obstacle would be, I asked about <sighs> policy and permit. And of course, that's an obstacle because there are construction assessments. You know, they have to do, they have to do impact studies. There are buffer zones that ha they have to adhere to. There are at least seven to eight different ministries that have to approve of the project and 25 different departments that have a say in how things are done. And then there's a thing called ILO 169. And he wouldn't tell me what it was because he was so frustrated with it. He said, just look it up, just look it up. So I did. ILO 169 is a uh, international treaty to respect the rights of indigenous peoples all over the world. So if the indigenous peoples are, uh, and Nepal was the first country to sign it, from what I can tell, very progressive. But if the uh, indigenous communities are going to be impacted, it could kill the project. All obstacles, man, all obstacles. So uh, yeah, um, another interesting thing they're doing, so I, I asked about funding. One thing you pointed out, Nepalese banks are very solid. That 70% loan, they used to only do less, 60%. Now on some small projects, they'll go up to 80% because they understand the risks and these hydro plants do come online. They do make their payments. They are good bets. Um, so you've got funding through local banks, through remittance, and almost none from China. I go, through remittance, how does that work? Well, people send money home to Nepal, or they hire an editor or two in Nepal and send money to them. And that money gets, can be used to fund the government. How does it work? But, but how does that work? If I'm giving money to you in your country, how does the government get it? And I had to dig into it, of course. When I send the dollars, the government keeps the dollars and pays the person uh, Nepali dues. Well, they're rupees, but I think Nepali dues is a better name for them. That's money because they can't send money out. They're limited to 500 bucks a year. So there's no outbound remittance, only inbound. That money can be used to buy the turbines from India, the transformers from India. Um, it makes it, it gives them a level of, and we're talking remittance is like eight or $9 billion a year. So that's a whole lot of budget to spend on something like this. Um, so oil export can improve. There are transmission lines already, uh, two uh, with three more already under construction. Capacity is expected to be able to handle terawatts of power. Um, again, very small country. Uh, I asked him about a transformer shortage. There isn't one for a couple reasons. First is the planning timeline is sufficiently long that you can place your orders. That's, of course, logical. But the other reason is these are the buyers of first resort. 
These are the buyers you want to make sure get their transformers. They're the ones who are starting the power. They're the ones who are going to be back every year, no matter what, buying more transformers. These are the best customers. They may not even uh, pay the highest rates for transformers. They might charge the AI data center guys double, triple. They get their transformers. It is not a problem. Um, so yeah, good, good planning. Uh, so who is going to use the power? This is where we're going to close it. And when I uh, explain who's going to use the power, I want to first say thank you guys so much for sending me here. It means the world to me. I can't make this channel without your support. You can subscribe, you can share the video, you can like all that. And if you're in Nepal, maybe you should uh, share this video with people who don't get Nepal if I've done a good job. So with that said, so who is going to use the power? Well, the first answer is the country's modernizing. With that comes higher power consumption, air conditioners, uh, clothes dryers, perhaps. I haven't asked about that one. Uh, LG had a booth at the NADA show, the car show, showing off washers and dryers. Those take electricity. But more than that, it's everyday life. It's computers, it's uh, televisions, it's uh, satellite internet. It's uh, Starlink is trying to come here hasn't happened yet. It's the electrification of automobiles. That's gonna take a lot of juice. There's not that many cars. Uh, the number would surprise you. For example, Indiana sold, I think 248,000 cars last year. Nepal has a total of about 250,000 cars. Total, total, total. So it's not a big market, but the bikes are coming too. The scooters are coming and all the thought you have about the hassle of charging would evaporate if you saw the queue to put gas in motorcycles. The motorcycles line up, the motorbikes line up, the guy doesn't even let you pump it yourself, he just stands there, you hand him a specific amount of money, he goes until it's done and you leave. That's it, let's go, let's keep this moving. And there's a long, like a 10, 20 minute queue just to get your gallon and a half of gas that goes in your motorbike. Ridiculous. But data centers. They are courting, and I don't know if the government is doing the courting, but the hydro authorities are courting data centers. Especially if you don't need 24 hour power. If you just need cheap power and intermittent is okay, if this is a backup data center where you wanna do some big crunching of big numbers, but only when it's cheap enough, bring them here. Of course, getting the chips in the country might be prohibitively expensive, but there are always solutions to different problems. Mm. Yeah, and those chips, I mean, it's one thing you can do. So, and then of course, export market. If they can make the power cheaper and make a deal with India, maybe it just works. Make it so that Bangladesh has less expensive power. Maybe send the power even farther. So that's what you can do. Guys, in the comments, what did I miss? What did I misunderstand? I'll leave it. I beg of you, like, subscribe, all that. Stay tuned and juicy. And I cannot wait to hear from you clever robots. Um, when I'm back home, which is probably already now, 